Welcome to Total Picture Media. I'm Peter Clayton. Thank you for tuning in. So, what's your opinion of 2020 so far? Here's mine. Here's Johnny. We're living in a country so politicized, it feels like we're all writing in carnival bumper cars fueled by crack cocaine and operated by Pennywise the Clown. Even the COVID-19 pandemic that has turned the world completely upside down is politicized. Then there's climate change. The West Coast is burning. The Gulf Coast keeps getting pounded by hurricanes. The Midwest was flooded most of the spring, destroying millions of acres of crops. The permafrost is melting in Siberia. Ice shelves are collapsing and breaking apart. Oh, and then there's Black Lives Matter and the fact that Black people keep getting murdered for no apparent reason other than the fact that they happen to be Black. This dumpster fire of a year gave me an idea for a series of vodcasts I'm calling WTF 2020, An Influencer's Guide to Navigating the Shit Show. I'm thinking this group of thought leaders, subject matter experts, innovators, and visionaries that I've put together can give us all some inspiration or or at least some hope. Today, I'm delighted to bring back to Total Picture Media John Sumzer, Principal Analyst for HR Examiner, an independent analyst firm covering HR technology and the intersection of people, tech, and work. If you're watching or listening to this, chances are you know John. Yeah, I'm doing the best work of my life. I'm having a blast. I'm doing That's awesome. nothing that I thought I'd be doing, and I'm I getting know. I'm getting seriously great about video and using Twitch style tools to deliver uh-huh. keynote speeches and shit. Wow. And John, thank you so much for taking time to participate in uh, my latest attempt to grasp some sort of reality in this surreal <laughs> nightmare we, we all find ourselves in. Uh, you know, I know you, you're waking up every morning in beautiful Northern California with air quality worse than Beijing. So uh, how are you and Heather doing? That's great. I never thought I'd, I'd get the chance to breathe chunky air. And, and, it, and it's, you know, it's uh, quite a thing. It's quite a thing. And then as we speak, the next fire is coming. Um, wow. And so it's, it's an interesting time. It's an interesting time. We talk about going back to the good old days when it was just a pandemic, economic collapse, and social unrest. Yeah, and, and before we started recording, you were telling me you guys are now considering moving. And I know how much you love Northern California. This is, this is four years in a row of fire... So, so this is the time of year when HR tech usually happens. Right. And, and for the last three HR techs, we've sat on the edge of the bed looking at our phones, deciding whether or not we needed to go home to save the house. And yes. um, this year, it, we've evacuated twice in a year, and it looks like we might get to go on vacation a third time. Um, but the whole state is smoky, so there's really nowhere to go. And that makes, oh that makes places with fresh air um, very appealing. I'm, I'm, I'm open to swapping a beautiful wine country house for something in hurricane territory. <laughs> <laughs> so, so before we get started in this What the Fuck segment, um, I recently watched, rewatched your closing keynote at the college recruiter boot camp held in Mountain View at the Googleplex. Remember that? I Two do. years that ago? Was, yeah. No, no, that was at least a decade ago. <laughs> and, um, Last week was two years ago. Yeah. You know, so I've been re- resurrecting my website, which blew up six months ago or something. I mean, it is 2020. Um, and as a matter of fact, I was supposed to do an interview with Tin Cup, but a tree fell on his house. So we had to reschedule that. So, I mean, this, uh, you, you know, know what? I think it's something about you. A tree fell on his house. The <laughs> fires are coming to get me. So don't call anymore, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, so, you know, watching this uh, 
opening presentation you made at your closing keynote, which was titled AI Algorithms and Who Owns the Outcome, uh, noting that the rules have changed, and boy, have they. Um, you had five things that you ideas that you presented. One was models are simplifications. Questions are better than answers. My favorite machines have opinions. Work the fundamentals and new kinds of management. So, like I said, this was done in December of 2018. Would you mind going through this list and, and giving us a, a refresh on some of these concepts that you had two years ago? Yeah, you might have to remind me as we go through it. But the, the first thing is that models are simplifications. And what's become apparent in the intervening couple of years is that the old-fashioned idea that the model with the least variables in it was the best model was based on primitive thinking. You can only do so much with a spreadsheet, you know, and you can only do so much with paper and pen. And so building models that were predictive that only had a couple of variables in them was the right way to do it. Today, we can account for everything. We have basically free computing and basically free storage. And so there is a quiet revolution going on in the what is a model and what do you do with it? arena. And this is where you see um, technology from NSA filtering into uh, the world of HR technology, because wow. those people know how to make complex models. And you see things like uh, uh, Johanna over at what used to be Engaged Talent and is now Workforce IQ, WorkLogic IQ, doing 40,000 variable predictions of the um, labor market. That stuff is all what the cutting edge looks like. Wow. So that's, that's the first thing. But the second thing that it, that's a sort of a footnote of that is anything that uses machine learning broke around the middle of March this year because machine learning is a function that looks through historical data in search of patterns that are repeatable. And guess what? none of the historical data has anything to do with what we're experiencing today. So machine learning is having a, a sort of a timeout while people are focusing on natural language processing as a way of um, bringing intelligence to the workforce. And so those, those things look like uh, what I call giving voice to the organization. So, um, the data about what HR does and what you can get from HR and what HR owes you is all stuck in like 30 million SharePoint archives. And nobody is in charge of keeping the SharePoint archives up to date and current and consistent. So there's no data governance in SharePoint. And because there's no data governance in SharePoint, everybody spends all of their time wondering if they're on the right revision of the document. And if you're trying to find out whether or not you could wear a tattoo to work, it matters which, <laughs> which revision of the document you get. If you're trying to figure out what PTO means in the COVID time, um, it matters. It totally matters what you're uh, uh, looking at. And so there are great projects using natural language processing to try to reconcile all of the data. Uh, the last one on the list was new forms of management. Well, right. you know what? Give me the predictor of the year award because because <laughs> the idea that the way you manage people who are remote is the same that you manage people who are distributed, I mean, who are in in the office. Not true. You don't do it the same way, and we're we're experiencing a very cool thing. So I, I was just talking with Ken Matos, who is the. Um, uh, Head of People Science for Culture Amp. You should talk to him. Um, and he's, he was talking about the fact that engagement scores went through the roof following the first round of response to COVID, and engagement scores are still at an all-time high. Um, and then he said, well, so we've been looking at what happens when people are exposed to sustained trauma. When people are exposed to sustained trauma, the first response is always to be a hero. And so that's why the engagement scores went up, because everybody went in to do heroic effort to make things work. 
and now they're burning out. And so he's predicting a dramatic fall off in engagement scores in the near future because you can't sustain that heroic effort. And the first pass, you know, you know, there are companies in our industry who have been handing out free advice about how to manage a remote workforce. Mm-hmm. And they ought to be they ought to be charged with malpractice. Um, nobody knows how to manage a remote workforce. And anybody who bases their management of a remote workforce on what's happened in the last six months is a moron. <laughs> you know, I have this I have this analogy. It's like because because fires are so close. It's like one day at about two o'clock in the morning. We got the phones went off. It was an evacuate right now alert. So we packed up some stuff and the car was on fire. We couldn't get in the car. We just started running for our lives. Jesus. And we come upon this Winnebago straight out of Breaking Bad, you know, broken glasses. It's, a, it's just a junk heap. And we get in it to hide from the fire. It turns out the keys are in it. And we start driving this Winnebago. Um, and, and so we... Every time we stop, the fire catches up with us. So we've been driving this Winnebago for six months. Every time we stop, the fire catches up with us. And we're starting to call it the new normal. <laughs> and there's nothing new or normal about this, this thing. We're in a damned Winnebago that's falling apart because we didn't have any place else to go. And we're not doing it right. So, so another thing that I've been doing is you can, if you go search Google for stock footage of people in meetings, <laughs> it's awesome. It's awesome. It's almost porn. It's so awesome. Um, and and you look at the stuff, and these people are in these rooms, and they're touching each other, and they're pointing at each other, and they're talking about things <laughs> over there, and they're talking about things over there. I really, I really started craving. Um, you know, a crowded conference room table where I'm afraid of knocking my coffee over on the person next to me. Um, I miss that. I miss. I miss that. I miss that. And and that's one of the things that we don't get in the new world. Yeah. What do you envision for 2021 regarding HR tech, John? So I think that what's happening is HR is having its priorities rearranged so that they resemble the priorities of an HR department in the 1920s. In the 1920s, the first thing that HR was responsible for was safety. In those days, if HR didn't watch out for safety, then when you cut your hand off, um, there was no doctor to sew you back together. Right? It was in, in those days, going to work meant encountering unsafe things, and they, there had to be a safety program, there had to be medical capability. And um, as we moved into the information age, you know, my joke used to be in heavy machinery places, you needed drug testing to make sure that people didn't hurt themselves. And in the Google area, you needed drug testing to make sure that people were high enough when they got to work. Um, And that shift where safety ceased to be an operating issue in 60 or 70% of companies, is now off the table and people are thinking about who's in charge of testing. You know, it turns out the bathroom is a big deal, right? Because because all sorts of aerosol gets created in the bathroom. And so you can't really have two people in the same bathroom in most corporate settings, which means that you have to either have an attendant and who'd give anybody that job, in the bathroom in order to have the office open, or you need a robot that will clean stuff up and you probably need sensors for the paper towels and sensors for the toilet paper and sensors on the hand sanitizer so that nobody ever risks going into the bathroom and uh, not being able to come out clean. Um, And this stuff hasn't even really started dawning on, on us, but what we're seeing is HR tech budgets are going up but the plans to spend money on the stuff we've always called HR tech are going down because what people are buying is the new kinds of safety and monitoring equipment and the new kinds of safety and monitoring software. And so we are um, headed in that way. So what I see in, in 2021 is a realignment 
Now, it's great because safety isn't just, am I going to get the bug when I go to work? Safety is freedom from sexual harassment. Safety is freedom from discrimination. Safety is freedom from bullying. Safety is freedom from hazing. Safety is freedom from economic insecurity. Um, and you need all of those things to make an organization safe. And once you have the organization safe, then you can start working on health, which is the maintenance of safety. And once you get everybody healthy, then you can start working on development, which is how you make the organization agile over time. But number one is going to be safety with a lot of different definitions. Safety includes making sure that your AI doesn't screw with your workforce. Um, and, and, and so ethics becomes a part of safety, right? And, and that's, you use a lot of the same gizmos to get the job done. It's the emphasis that changes inside of HR. On that same note, I mean, you were talking about machine learning and how that's sort of blown up. What about AI? It, does it still matter? Oh geez, yeah, yeah. If you're not if you're not in the thick of having AI in your company, uh, you're writing the um, prescription for failure. Now, now making coherent decisions about AI is different from wholesale early adopter embrace of everything that comes along down the pike, right? And so, so there are very thoughtful people. Another another person you ought to talk to sometime is John Strauss from um, uh, Greenhouse. Um, and they are taking a very disciplined, very patient, not rushing to follow the crowd approach to what they can do with intelligent tools because what they, te what they tend to see there is that the gee whiz stuff doesn't really produce value yet. Right? So, so there's some things but it's early going and you want to be careful about, about knowing what you get. Now, I'd argue that you want to buy something complicated and have some of the people on your team working on some of the more complicated AI implementations because this is a thing that is going to dominate the way the work gets done over the next decade, right? And so, so you can wait for it. Um, and learn after everybody else has learned, or you can get started now, and it would be in your interest if you want to keep your company alive to start now. You know, speaking about AI, um, there's a really frightening episode on Yang Speaks with Nina Schick called Seeing is Not Believing, and Nina is the author of a book called Deep Fakes, and she describes very convincingly the world of what she calls synthetic media, where videos and audio can be convincingly uh, altered without anyone noticing. Um, have you been having any conversations with about deep fakes with HR tech leaders and well, how, how this you, you media know, so can let's, be manipulated? Let's, let's run this to ground a little bit. So, okay. so, so uh, fake news, there, there's been some good, interesting survey work out in the last couple of weeks. Fake news accounts for something like fifteen hundredths of a percent of the total media flow in the in the universe. So there are aggressively engineered fake stuff is, is out there, but the idea that it's widespread and is um, shifting the way that we think things, I think that's aluminum foil hat shit. Um, you know, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You could do it, and um, um, if if you were to follow uh, what's Michael Vandervoort on uh, Instagram, he's got a constant flow of his face dubbed into movies, right? And so you can do you can do this <laughs> stuff, um, but I, you you know, although I might argue make a political argument here a little bit, but generally speaking, people are pretty smart. Um, and generally speaking, people can tell what's too good to be true from what's not. And, and so, and so, so I'm, I'm less scared about that. Um, it does appear to sell a lot of stuff. So there's a lot of, um, um, blockchain based identity management tools being sold to HR leaders because God knows somebody might 
slightly exaggerate what they said on the resume, and it may not be true. Um, uh, but nah, it's it's way overkill, I think. Well, I want to return. You brought up ethics. So, um, in your opinion, does HR and HR vendors and departments need ethic boards or some sort of monitoring thing about ethics? I think I think it's really important. And and so let me clarify what I mean by ethics. Laws are you can do this and you can't do that. And a lot of 20th century implementations of ethics boil down to you can't do this and you can't do that, and you can do this and you can do that. And and I'm talking about ethics that ask questions. That that is, is this the right thing to do? Do we understand the consequences of what we're doing? Are we committed to never harming an employee with our technology? Are we committed to never harming a customer with our technology? And how do we tell if we do? And so I'm doing stuff. I'm organizing a, a I'm really excited about this. I'm organizing an AI ethics advisory board for a company called Arena. And that AI ethics advisory board is composed of people who represent groups that are most likely to have the short end of the stick with AI. Um, and so we're going to we're going to do an extraordinary job there of introducing the place the people who are most likely to be negatively impacted into the design process. Um, and it's an exciting, different, multi-dimensional game where we have to train these fifteen or so people in AI and ethics so that they can see. And over time, it's a three-year project, and over the three years, we think we're going to build a cadre of people who can go out and become the way that ethics gets started inside of HR. For my money, ethics is just another word for coherent decision-making in a time when there are no firm answers. So you have to ask, what's the right thing to do now? Then you go try to do that, and then two weeks from now, you go, is that still? This is how you get a workplace reopened and then shut it down when the when the numbers go sideways is by not accepting the reopening as the final destination, but just as a as a piece of progress in time. And since everything that we've learned, all the historical data is wrong, this is the only way there is to proceed is test, experiment, try, fail, start over again. Uh, until things get clear, and it's going to be a while till they're clear. Do you envision more tech consolidation next year? More, you know, vendors have, uh, going bankrupt? Yeah. And I, I have never seen tech consolidation mean anything other than an explosion of the number of companies in that particular space. So. Huh. Fortunately or unfortunately, if you build a company and I buy it, 10 venture capital firms will be looking to form a company that does what your company did. Um, and, so, and so the money will fly because, because the fact that I bought your company indicates that there's a market for your company. And so, so consolidation is a very limited perspective on what actually happens. It's sort of like chopping the head off a hydra. You chop one head off and you get nine back. Um, um, and, so, and so I don't really think of it as consolidation, but there will be, because nobody can keep up with all this stuff. There'll be a ton of acquisition of smaller companies. And what about recruiters? Do you think, I, you know, I, I see on Twitter and Facebook and things that a lot of recruiters are being laid off and, uh, a lot of really good recruiters now are working as independent contractors, you know, more like in the sourcing model, if you will. Do you see that continuing or do you think these companies, once uh, things stabilize a little bit, are, are going to be hiring back their recruiters? In 2007, there were a quarter million recruiters. At the end of 2009, there were 100,000 recruiters. Wow. Um, and that's what, that's what happens in the economic cycle, right? And, and when this thing crashes, 
when this thing crashes. It's going to be a mess, but we can't tell yet, right? Right. So, so the reason that the layoffs haven't been serious yet is we've been coasting along on three trillion dollars worth of stimulus. That, that that money went a long, long way, and it's just now starting to peter out. And so, um, if the stimulus isn't reestablished, the economic crash will come before the election, and if the stimulus is reestablished, the economic crash will come after the election. Um, but the truth is, we're not getting the things done that we used to have done uh, because we haven't really figured out how to work in this environment. And so, so there, there's going to be hell to pay. There's going to be real hell to pay. Um, and uh, when there are people standing in line to get a job, you don't really need a lot of uh, recruiters to process that. Let's talk a little bit about conferences. I mean, so much of what we have done over the years normally is, I mean, you were mentioning HR tech is now usually. Um, when do you think live conferences are going to come back? Do you think we're going to have any live conferences in 2021? Will anybody show up? Uh, will companies send anybody there? Will anybody want to exhibit? So, so I think that it, within a month or so, we're going to lock down hard and it's going to last till May. Wow. Right? There will be, right? Because as the cold weather comes, people are going to go inside. As people are going to go inside, the caseload is going to go up. The caseload goes up to a certain point and you trip the wire and everybody goes home. Um, and so, so we're going to be locked down till summer, till the weather's warm enough to go back outside again. Um, and uh, people will have a very different view of this stuff by then. You know, eight or nine more months of lockdown with serious constraints like they're doing in England right now. That's coming. That's unavoidably coming. Most of the attention today is spent on reopening and how we're going to get things reopened, but, but boy, that's a, that's a, a fantasy. And um, I don't think we're going to see live conferences for many years. Um, that said, I'm seeing some pretty interesting stuff happening in the virtual conferences. There are people who are doing it really well. Um, and I have a feeling that the HR tech people are going to give that a run for its money. That they they have the right audience and the right content. So they're even going to have a full time analyst room in their virtual conference, which tickles me. And I, I, um, uh, but but I think it's going to be a while before I want to go catch COVID so that I talk <laughs> yeah. in public. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and you're right. There have uh, you know I I participated in uh, in a HR collaboration zone virtual conference that was done on Zoom uh, a week or so ago, and it you know you were able to go in and book meetings with people, and people would come in and and they would acknowledge you know and say yeah let's have this meeting at three o'clock, and then you know through the the whole platform the meeting went live and um, it it worked quite well. So I th people are starting to figure out how to do this virtually, right? And yep. the other thing, John, is, you know, for years, companies have been saying, oh, you can't work from home. Um, we need you at the office. You have to come to our office. And all of a sudden, it's like they figure out, well, we're saving money. That's good. Uh, people are more productive. That's good. Um, they're happier. That's good. There's not as much churn, and that's good. So you know, I, I and certainly for populations such as uh, people who have disabilities, this has been a, a boon for them being able to work at home. Um, and you know, I see, I keep seeing these reports, like in San Francisco, uh, people are fleeing the Bay Area uh, because they're all working from home. And if you if you're working from home. Why pay the the rent that you have to pay in San Francisco? Um, do you think this trend is going to continue? Some, some, but but 
But what's going to happen very rapidly is people who leave San Francisco to go live in Montana yeah. are going to have their salaries reduced, right? <laughs> you know, they're, they're going to end up poor in Montana. And, and it's better to be poor in San Francisco than it is to be poor in Montana. I, I'm pretty sure of that. Um, so so I, I'm not sure that it is going to be as embraced as you might think. And when I talk to working parents who are working from home in houses that weren't designed to be simultaneously offices and schools, they're dying to go back to work. They're dying for the house. solitude of an office. Yeah. Yep. Um, they they would like to have somebody else teaching their kids, um, um, and and that's just not happening right now. And so so I think we're I think we're a long way from knowing whether or not remote work works. We know we know that we can do it. But we don't know if we can continue to hit the numbers while we do it. Right? That's the heroic phase. Like I said, said earlier, the heroic phase is ending, and people are going, "Oh, yeah, I can work ninety hours a week and take my vacation staring at the computer monitor that I turned off." Um, uh, but that's not really what I want to do. And so, and so, I think we're going to see a reevaluation of whether or not this thing that we're experiencing is an adequate place to call home or if it's just that Winnebago that I was talking about earlier. Wow. Yeah. So um, I want to play a clip from your HR Tech Weekly episode. Uh, as most of you tuning into this probably know, John does a, a, a lot of podcasting, and including uh, HR Tech Weekly, which uh, I Highly recommend anybody who is involved in talent acquisition or HR uh, listen to. And your uh, episode number 285 um, gets into talking about what's happening with video. So let's have a listen to that. Where we are right now with video is where we were with PCs in 1980. That if you want to have a vibrant career, whatever your discipline, you need to deliver the best video of anybody that, around you. And people who pay attention to that and start delivering high quality video and start working on maintaining the quality of their video production are going to have better careers than people who don't. So that's the first thing. We're headed in, we're just at the beginning of the video era, and it is going to be the dominant reason that people get ahead in the next five years. It's going to be astonishing to see what people do. And it's going to happen very quickly. So this time next year, we'll be talking about production techniques that we don't even understand yet, and everybody will be talking about. Yeah. Well, take a look. Take a look at my video feed here. Um, uh, my video feed is um, well. It involves a camera that you can tune to the lights. It involves a production tool that allows you to get the green screen right. Um, and it involves a sound processor that takes the horrible hissing noise that my S's make sometime and uh, takes that out and adds a floor of quiet behind it so all the background noise is gone. So, so the full up video product out is good glass on the lens of the camera, good sound control in the mic and the um, uh, sound processing equipment, um, good facilities for lighting, real lights, and um, a solid use of green screen without making the green screen produce uh, nauseating effects like like the virtual green screens do. Right. And so that's right. those are those are the fundamentals, and you can do the fundamentals anywhere from a hundred bucks to fifteen thousand. Right. There's a pretty broad range sure. of of tools and equipment, you can build a little uh, video studio in your house. And, and my house looks a lot like a video studio. It's the sea of wires and chalk marks and lights and cables and microphones. When I, when I go to get on the phone these days, 
there's seven mics and seven cameras and I have to figure out which is the right one to talk into. Um, um, and, and as we saw in the begin, beginning of the conversation, I knew the I knew my voice was going out, but I did, couldn't tell where your voice was coming in. And so I had to go through all of the listening devices to um, figure out <laughs> which rest, because, because my machines all think they're smarter than me. And so they want to reroute the audio in ways that I don't want to reroute the audio, and they overrule me. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like in my, in my webcam, in my webcam, it's a really good webcam, and it's got an automated white balance. Um, um, and if you let it automate the white balance, then I look like this really bright pink guy who's been out in the sun too long. I don't know why. I haven't been able to figure it out. It may be that the green screen is not green enough or something. But, but anyhow, I turn out pink. Um, and so you got to, it's awful. It's like being an adolescent. You've got to look at yourself and figure out what the colors are. Um, and what the light is doing to those colors and find find ways to consistently deliver the same you to the environment so you don't have to tweak so much every time. But I've been telling people that doing video as a communicator is not like writing or talking on the phone. When you do video as a communicator, you have to have a checklist. And, and if you don't knock off all the things on the checklist before you start delivering the video, it looks crappy. Um, and that's, that, that means that doing video is more like flying a plane than it is like driving a car. People certainly are upgrading their equipment to a certain extent because more, as we all know, more people are, you know, are, are doing business via Zoom and Skype and other, you know, go to meeting. And so video has become uh, an integral tool, business tool for most people, especially those who are spending a lot of time working at home. And so they've had to upgrade something, you know, to make themselves look halfway decent and sound halfway decent. And a lot of companies have, um, you know, helped support this and funded their upgrading of their computers and cameras and things. So, you know, from, from my perspective, you know, I started podcasting in 2005. And there was no way we could do fit video like this in 2005, you know, right. even close to this. But now it, it's to the point where I can do, you know, just about anyone um, I can do a decent vodcast with. That's true. But, you, you know, so my, my wife, who you can follow on Twitter, at Heather Bussing, is an extraordinary photographer. She is. And if, really you, is. Want, if you want to insult her, if you really want to insult her, you go, man, I really like your photographs. What camera do you use? Or you could also say, oh, I love your photographs. You must have a great camera. And um, equipment, equipment's nice, but you can achieve most of the lighting effects that you need with two table lamps and a, um, and a, and a pretty good uh, uh, webcam if that's your budget. Right, and 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 the question isn't. Uh, let me tell you, you can spend a lot of money, and 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 every little bit more money gets you incrementally a little bit better. But what, what how you use it? What really matters is not the equipment. What matters is how you think about your delivery and who you're talking to and how you think about the content and how you think about how entertaining the whole thing is. And so it's a, it's much more of a design problem really than a video problem, but it takes the form of video. And just to, just to sort of tie this all together, when I was uh, very young, um, I happened to be starting work at about the time the first PCs were coming out of IBM, and I talked my boss into getting me one. And the fact that I had a PC from IBM um, led to an extraordinary engineering career, even though I had a philosophy degree. Um, uh, but I would show up at meetings, and I would have printouts, you know, and I would have charts, and and, and so... I would have the pieces of paper around the table with the printouts of the charts in them, and because they were printed and pretty, um, people said, oh, this must be right. 
right? And so I got the benefit of the doubt over and over and over and over again. I got the benefit of the doubt. And that's going to happen with video. If you're looking for work, they're going to hire the person who delivers the best video, period. Um, and if you don't like it, tough. Um, and if you think it's biased, it is. Um, and the answer is, with whatever budget you have, get on the issue of making your video the highest quality video you could make because people make decisions based on appearances. And it is really hard to figure out that the video is biasing people because there's no, there's no way to um, automatically compare quality and discount it. So you can't say, oh, John's got super video. Let's minus 10 points off our, our, our appraisal of who he is and whether or not he'll fit in. That just isn't going to happen. Um, and so there'll be bias. It's an economic bias. That means it's kind of a class bias, but it's a technical bias, and you can learn the technology, and you should learn the technology because the people who do are going to have an edge. And in the next 10 years, having an edge is going to make all the difference in the world because things are going to, you know, we're going to have to pay for all of the mess that we've made in the last year or so. And that means things are going to be different and tight and more competitive. Interesting. Yeah, I, I agree. So I, I want to, um, well, first of all, thank you so much for taking time to uh, do this with me today. I, I really appreciate it. But I, uh, I want to change the topic a little bit for a minute. Uh, tell us about your your new 2020 Index of Intelligent Tools and HR Technology, which is um, a major research report called The Birth of HR as a, Sci as a System Science. Well, that's last year's report. And, and what we did this year is really thins things back. So th that report is out. You can get it on the website. And it is a comprehensive look at what's happening in AI. There's very little of it that has changed significantly in the last year because everybody's priorities have been on um, solving the how do we get work done problem. And so there haven't been enormous numbers of advances in um, HR technology. So we're letting it stand for a little bit. And it's worth the time. It's got a clear story of what it means that machines have opinions. And, and what, what that means is that, that the data and the models that machines use to generate predictions are all biased inherently, and you can't really chase the bias out of that. And so when the machine says, you should hire Peter Clayton, well, that's great. That's good input to your hiring decision-making process. It should never be the only input that you take to your hiring decision-making process because there may be something in the um, way that Peter has uh, put his package together that causes the machine to bias in his favor, and you may not be able to sort that out. So, so you treat the input from a machine like one voice on a jury rather than the whole jury. Um, and um, that's that's what it means that machines have opinions, and that's what the report is good at talking about. Well, is there John, is anything you would like to share with us uh, that we haven't discussed regarding uh, HR technology, TA Tech, twenty twenty one, the shitstorm we're living in? I think I think the only thing that I really want to want to do is go back and underline the importance of having an ethics function in your HR department and in your HR tech company. Um, we are headed into a time where we don't know a lot of stuff. There's just an infinite variety of things that we don't know, and um, when we make decisions about that kind of stuff, it's easy to let our inherent biases overrule good rational decision making. So, so um, John Strauss at Greenhouse is fond of saying that they don't eliminate bias, but they do help you make better decisions. And what we're looking for more than anything else is the capacity to make better decisions. Interesting, yeah. Um, so 
For our listeners who may not be familiar with you, what is the best way for them to connect with you? Well, you can send me a piece of email at john at hrexaminer.com. Um, that probably gives you a 50% shot at getting answers. <laughs> uh, you can follow me on Twitter at, um, uh, at John Sumser. And if you, can, if, you, if you sort of ping me in Twitter, you have a better chance of getting a response. Um, I'd give you my phone number, but the message on my phone says, text me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember the last time I talked to somebody on the phone at length. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, and then you can go to hrexaminer.com. Well, again, John, thanks so much for taking time to speak with me today here on Total Picture. It's, it's, uh, it's great to see you, um, and good luck out there. And I hope the fires, you know, stop at some point and you guys can get the hell out of there, you know? Yeah, it'd be great. It'd be great. We're looking forward to the rainy season.